Welcome everyone to the first Association for Software Testing webinar of 2019. Uh, today, our guest is Brent Jensen. He's giving us a presentation on building a data-centric modern quality culture. Uh, I just mentioned to Brent, I've been trying to get him to do this talk for months, so I'm glad that we have him here. For those who don't know Brent, he is a longtime Microsoft veteran. He now heads a data science team in Azure Compute. He's my favorite co-host of my favorite podcast, testing podcast, which is AB Testing. If you haven't heard of the AB Testing podcast, you have now, you should check it out, you should Google it. Uh, Brent is also the co-creator along with Alan Page of the Modern Testing Principles, which is a very, very popular uh, idea concept that, that Brent and, and Alan have been developing on the AB Testing podcast. Uh, so with that information, uh, Brent, go ahead and, and take it away. Hey, thank you, Chris. Um, Excuse me. Uh, yeah, uh, really excited about doing this presentation. Uh, I, I appreciate the invite. I apologize for the delay, my friend. Um, I am hugely uh, hard to get a hold of and uh, irresponsible in a, a lot of these regards. I think we had this originally booked for last December, and as you know, life sometimes happens. Um, for the people on, on the webinar, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate you joining, and, and I, I do hope that you walk away with uh, something new and something learned. Uh, for those who do follow the Modern Testing Principles, I, I do think that this content is heavily related to Principles 1, 5, and 6. Um, and for those who are already one of the three, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate the, uh, the fellowship. Um, to begin with the, with the end, as soon as I can, there we go. Um, so my goal for this talk is to try to inspire people to try to get into the data space. Um, my experience has shown that QA is very good at this uh, because of the way that they think about problems. Um, there is several books that I recommend. If you read only one, then, then the Eric Ries book I show here. Uh, but I would say these are all sort of the, the, the key ones that I've used to develop sort of my approach. Uh, I think Chris may have mentioned that I spent most of my career as a middle manager in QA, as a test manager. Uh, then I shifted over to a development role within the Bing organization and saw what they were doing with data and uh, abandoned and went into a data science role. Now, for me, I went back to school uh, and that was absolutely uh, the best thing I could have done for my career at that point in time. Um, if, if you are data leaning, uh, then I highly recommend it as well. Uh, most master's degrees in this take, take two years. And what I found is on, on day one with the first class, I was able to immediately use what I was learning. The books I, sh I show you here kind of gives you um, perspective on how to think about the problem, which is really the first thing you need to do. Uh, if you don't know where you're going, uh, any road is gonna get you there, including no road at all. So this will help you set up a, a North Star and a vision. All right, um, so now let's talk about the, the problems. First one, uh, there was a study that came out uh, two years ago, we talked about it on the podcast. Uh, and I'll just tell you up front, uh, we'll, we'll send, we'll do a slide share here. If you wanna follow the link, this this link is for a company and it's the study is for a company that's trying to sell their automation wares. So it's heavily pivot around this. However, they did a survey based study and, and there were things that, that came out of that. Number one, they have a prediction that QA and dev roles will eventually merge. And what they have noticed is new concerns popping up. Number one, um, uh, 
that there's an expectation of the QA organization to sort of understand the business requirements more than functional requirements and align with that um, quality over code correctness. Now here, what I'm, uh, what I refer to code correctness is sort of, I would say the traditional view of quality, uh, bugs, test cases, uh, that sort of thing. Whereas quality here is intended to mean uh, customer satisfaction. Um, and then agility and speed over robustness. There's this, not just this report, but there's a large number of reports coming out that where people are expressing problems or with their QA organization being too slow to deliver quality. Um, and one common problem pointed out was that tests weren't reflecting production. Uh, and this is one of the issues uh, where that's been long sort of torturing QA organizations in that when you do a test, uh, a lot of the times it's very, very much a clean room environment and a clean room environment uh, generally is the operational state of a product exactly one millisecond. Uh, and then the product becomes dirty as it gets uh, continuous usage. Um, all right, the number one thing that I want to, the next problem is, so as the last report said, is, is talking about business priorities over functional priorities. And one thing I would ask you to think about, the work that you're doing today, and I am assuming that the majority on the line are, are in a test or a QA type role. Um, here is a list of what's known as the big seven, and it's, it's the biggest, it's the top things that CEOs uh, care about. And uh, I stole this from a deck on how to do elevator pitches. And what I want you to think about is the work you're doing today. Do you understand the connection to any of these big seven? Now, I do know a, a lot of QA will immediately go to cost or risk. Um, but what I would ask you to go a little bit deeper, do you actually, can you follow the exact chain or do you say, hey, I'm automating, automating reduces cost and then stop there. This is the sort of um, deep thinking I want, I, I'd like to inspire you to sort of think about today is do you know exactly how it benefits the business? Okay. There is another problem Oh, yeah, let's skip that. There's another problem where we are are what is known as the the age of the customer. Okay. And <clears throat> years ago, I wrote this up on uh my uh my blog. And I asked people to assume that there are two pieces of code and shipping in the same product and the same size and complexity, and which one's a higher quality? One is bug free, but no one's using and one is buggy as heck that's getting tons of use. And um, what I'm able to report is about 80% of people picked option two. And one of the things I wanna challenge on is, is sort of what is quality and how is, how is that defined? Uh, in the modern testing uh, principles, I'll, I'll just say it up front, we define it as, um, Problems being solved by the customer. Uh, quality, quality and craftsmanship certainly is important, but it's far less important than whether or not the software is being used by a customer and helping to satisfy their needs. Um, the reason why we're in the age of the customer right now is um, they have customers have more choice than they've ever had. And they, uh, first and foremost, switching cost is um, super small nowadays. It used to be back when I started in the software industry, right? Uh, I remember installing uh, NT on a, on a server, NT, Windows NT came in floppy, a little, you know, 1.44 floppies, and it was 35 of them. And once you spent the four hours actually successfully in installing it, um, you weren't really motivated to go through that again because uh, 
everyone else was a similar thing. But today we have an apps world. We have a services world. People, people can find another option instantly and everyone offers trials. So uh, retaining the customer is critical. Okay? And then there's several things with tradition in the past that isn't really gonna get us to where we need to go in terms of quality. Um, there, there are common approaches that, that are within our current tradition. Like the one that really bugs me the most is sort of the bet the farm approach, where, where you have generally a leader that's really charismatic and uh, really strongly believes in the direction. It, it, it turns out actually uh, today, um, venture capitalists for, for startups, there's, there's a, actually a change in even how that works. And a lot of venture capitalists won't, uh, if they find out that you've hired, say, a VP of sales, they won't fund you. Because every leader, every inventor in this particular case, believes in their concept. And so they're willing to bet the farm because they don't believe there's a risk. Um, so if you hire a VP of sales and the VP of sales comes back and says, hey, you can't sell this, uh, you as the inventor are likely to just go, oh, that guy's a moron. Uh, whereas venture capitalists today, what they want you to do is go and reach out to the customer directly yourself because you, uh, if you have a bad idea, uh, it's not going to succeed through that. There are other issues. Uh, there's a preventative model. What is used to us uh, in the QA is, uh, I know when I was doing it, a, a month-long test pass uh, was very common. Um, and that prevention model was used to sort of justify additional delays in shipping and, and additional delays in costs. There was also a prevailing uh, view, for example, that requirements are correct. You have a PM, talk to a handful of customers, wrote a 50-page doc, wrote down the requirements, and then um, the whole machine um, spun up and, and tried to burn through them. Uh, these don't really work today. Uh, the, it, it creates a large amount of delay. And then in, in today's world, a whole world has changes in just a few months time. Um, I, I am in Azure Compute and we're constantly adapting to market changes. Um, the last thing is is sort of an, a prevailing assumption that all that all bugs matter to the customer, and certainly this is context sensitive. Uh, and in the prevention model, you had no choice; all bugs did matter because once you shipped, it was really hard to fix it. But today, with like continuous integration and continuous deployment, um, you can you can root out and you can prevent the critical bugs from shipping to customers and then use the customer data, the customer telemetry to identify, hey, what's the next set of important things to work out? What features do customers not even care about? And then the last one, typically a QA role has been around, uh, well, there's a large camp that says QA's job is to provide information. Um, <clears throat> I reject this notion. I, I think in information providing is critical, uh, but I think there's a lot more value in, in between the ears of the, of the majority of the QA organization. And I think they should stand up and start not only providing information, but making decisions off of it and owning those decisions. Um, all right. And then the last thing here is, uh, again, the business needs to scale. There's lots of decisions, data, uh, threats are constant, they change. And the resources that any particular business has in terms of calendaring and engineering time, they're precious. Once they're gone, they're gone. The, so in order to scale and speed up and still deliver quality, we have to come up with approaches that help this scale. And the big part of this deck 
is around, okay, how to start using uh, data and thinking through it so that you can target what's really important to your customer base and therefore your business. Um, one, just one insight, I don't think I've actually brought this up on the podcast. My current team, the majority of them are, well, I guess it's true, the majority of them are formerly tests. And one of the main reasons there is it's really hard to train the experience around customer empathy and risk. Uh, and that's really invaluable in the space that I am in. Um, specifically, I, I am accountable for doing data science on customer analytics. Um, they, they have an instinct on this. Uh, and it turns out the data and the data science stuff is not that hard to start. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go into the solutions part next. Um, or, and in a nutshell, hopefully uh, I've done this a good enough job, uh, but here what, I'll just say in four, four different steps, what you really wanna try to do and maybe the, what I'm gonna propose in the next several slides works for you or maybe it doesn't. But this is what you wanna to try to do at a top down. You wanna to try to remove the theory, understand where you're standing on intuition or practice or tradition and go, okay, is that still true? Then try to quantify the risk. I do believe that people in the QA role, one of their primary goals is there's sort of an insurance policy for a, for a software house, um, but don't don't uh, just stand on a principle here. Try to go, okay, how can we identify ways to identify risk and how risky things are? Then work to automating that decision, not just providing information, but automate the decision and take the action, all right? That's it in a nutshell. All right, on the on the podcast, we're famous for our tangents, and I'm probably the primary cause of it. Um, so let, before we go into this, let's start off with what is a data science job. And I get a lot of questions from managers who don't have data scientists, and they tell me, hey, Brent, I want to hire a data science to do all that data stuff. Um, what do I look for? And generally, my answer is a diplomatic version of a unicorn. Um, because they think that data science is, uh, a lot of times people will view data science as, as synonymous with magic. And they, they don't really have a strong sense of what these guys do and what to look for. Um, so let me let me try to demystify that a little bit right now. Um, this is my definition. Uh, they help a business drive a beneficial action by understanding and exploiting re uh, relationships present in the data to improve decisions. Okay, so data science at the end of the day is really about decision making. Okay, and we have learned a lot of great techniques to that can be applied to the data uh, that makes our guesses just significantly more um, smart. Uh, now, even data scientists have a have a confusion on this one. Uh, the I've spent the last several years, I've interviewed now hundreds of data scientists and I asked them why did they leave their job? And uh, you can see from this, they have multiple different perspectives of what they got into. And even data science, a lot of data scientists think that their job is to build a model. Well, you can't build a model if you don't have good data. And data engineers generally don't understand what good data is for a data scientist. Now, here's the positive thing I can tell you. If you enter into this going that your end goal is to drive a decision that will drive action. Um, and your starting is with the data. 
the majority of the techniques that a data scientist will use is is, is very small. Um, there's there's a lot of specializations, there's particular problems, but it is not hard to get started. Um, it, you just need to make sure you understand the journey. It's get the data and finish with a decision being made and action taken. Okay? Uh, a large portion of data scientists, unfortunately, don't understand that. And they don't know how to defend or communicate it. And that leads us to this world where unicorns are common. Um, <clears throat> the, there is a thing called the data culture maturity. Uh, these are the terms I use. And it starts on the left with data oblivious, where you're in a situation where decisions are pri primarily being made by intuition. Um, so a requirement stock written six months ago, sure, that's an informed intuition, but if you're still sticking to that plan, it's intuition. And certainly until the product's been made, that is not gonna be available. Uh, and then it ends with data-centric, where data analysis is just core to most decisions. And it is a key aspect to scaling and shipping products and focusing your limited calendar and engineering resources. There's a couple of phases in between. The real critical thing about this slide is that once you get started, try to do your best guess as to where you are uh, in your organization and don't skip ahead. Uh, if you try to go from data oblivious straight to data centric, uh, you, you are just not going to succeed. There's going to be too much resistance uh, because to move forward, it isn't just about convincing people. You have to stepwise convince them to trust in your data and trust in the decisions being made by that, and that will not happen overnight. Uh, particularly several people, uh, several organizations I've encountered, hopefully it's not in yours, but you will uh, you will have an individual who drives everything by intuition and um, holds somewhat of a dic dictator type role um, where everyone else just has to follow and it's a, a bet the farm. If you're in that situation, uh, you really need to start with that oblivious and, and start slowly and, and show how this can scale. I have a formula here. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through it uh, in, in the following slides. Um, when you're working through this from, say, that oblivious to all the way to the end, what you want to do is you want to you, you want to align uh, align, collect, inform, recommend, and act. And alignment means connect the dots between the work that you're trying to do and an actual business KPI. Think back to the big seven that I mentioned um, earlier in the deck. And then you're trying to generate hypotheses and generate users. Now users in this particular case is who is gonna take action should your hypotheses hold true? Who right now, a lot of the situation is you have somebody who is in the way or, or part of the process to make a decision before things can go forward. Maybe you have uh, an individual who owns the ship or no ship decision as, as an example. You want to know who it is that you're trying to inform and generate data to, to influence. That's going to be step one. Step two is, is collect the data and curate it. Step three is actually inform them. Now, you'll see here, um, inform is an important step. Uh, and here, what we want to do is bid, bid, build visuals and democratize. Now, uh, a lot of people, uh, Alan makes fun of me on the podcast for using that term. Here, what democratized means is make your data available uh, that you've cleaned and cooked so that self-service can happen. Because uh, I can guarantee you that whatever visuals you build, once you do this, the demand is going to be super high and you need to be able to enable people to 
to um, go straight to the data and build their own. Otherwise, you'll never get out of informed uh, stage. You will be sucked into, like what I mentioned in the prior slide, data scientists feeling that all they do is build reports. Um, getting to the next phase is recommend. I'll, I'll talk about the Pareto order and, and what it might mean to build a recommendation system. And then finally, automation, um, and that's involves uh, productizing and improving accuracy. So alignment. Um, so there's key phases here. Uh, I'm not gonna go in depth on this one. I'll do a slide share uh, and I'll in, um, but what you wanna do is use what's known as actionable metrics, not vanity metrics. Um, a vanity metric, for those who are not familiar, a vanity metric is any metric who, when you look at it and it goes up, its intent is you should feel good. And when it goes down, its intent is you should feel bad. The way you can sort of discern a vanity metric from an actual metric is an actual metric generally tends to tell you what you need to do next. Um, if you want more details there, uh, you can certainly see it up on the web, either Lean Analytics or, or Lean Startup goes into stronger details there. Uh, a simple start for a vanity metric is it would be to go to the big seven, pick a most relevant one, and then pick a KPI that you're using today. It probably isn't gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be a good start. So if you were to say, um, let, let's say test test cases executed, right? Then a better metric would be test cases executed divided by cost or divided by risk or even better divided by market share. Um, now, because that will, what that will do is it, is, is it helps you to balance it with what's actually important to the business and help you stay connected to the business KPI. Um, now, when you when you are thinking through this phase, um, you want to you want to sort of talk through, you know, again the current decision makers, and you also want to not specifically target executives. When you're going through this and you're thinking about actions, you want to target actions to the people who would actually take that action. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, in my experience, what people will do is they'll build um, these nifty little presentations and the whole purpose in life is to show in, in the monthly review with the executive. Um, and while it may be amusing to, to watch the executive yell at a particular team, it doesn't actually help the business. The executives, they are busy doing other things. They have hired people to take care of the business. Target them. Um, and the more you target, or once you have sufficiently targeted the people who are gonna take an action, uh, building an executive scorecard or an executive summary is actually really cake. If you do executives, then do the actionable folks. Uh, history has shown it is actually much, much harder uh, to, to solve the needs of the business. Uh, if you have multiple decision makings, um, validate with them. Now, here, next slide, I'm skipping over the, the, the graph there in the middle because the next slide I'm gonna go into more detail. Here, what you wanna do, uh, for those who are already listeners, uh, this is another example of what we talk about in episode number 82. I highly recommend that we spend almost the entire hour discussing this model. Um, the, what you wanna do is you wanna, when, you, when you're thinking through a problem, so again, I talk here and we're talking about, we have a particular problem that you're working on. I gave an example of test cases being executed, right? Um, but then what you wanna do, you wanna come up with what do you think is the key KPI? And then you wanna do is you wanna create a hypothesis. Uh, and that hypothesis is gonna be a statement of belief, something that you believe to be true. Hey, if we add more test cases, we will get more market share. 
Um, then the next phase is think through if that hypothesis is true, what actions would you take? What actions wouldn't you take? Or if it held false, what actions would you take? Then from understanding those actions, then what you need to do is go, what are the questions you need to ask of the data to be able to confidently pick an action? And then from the questions, you should be able to reverse engineer the data. Again, episode 82, we go into that um, well in depth. Um, highly recommended. <clears throat> All right, collect. So if you have a, a product that is a service or even, even um, uh, shipped products, they often will have the ability to ship backlogs with permission. Essentially, get whatever product logs you can. And if your business allows, go and add instrumentation if needed. Right, I just went through uh, on the prior slide, you know, if you go through that exercise, it'll be able to tell you what data you need to instrument and you can start there. Certainly, depending on, on you know, the delivery cycle of, of this, you'll have to, you have to be cognizant of, of how adaptable you can be and how proactive you need to be in thinking through these things. Uh, do not instrument everything. Uh, do not instrument nothing. Um, this is one of those things where the right amount of stuff that you need um, is going to be value driven. And a lot of the times I have found that if you just start with the logs that your dev team has put in, uh, you can get very far. Um, the, the book I put on the first page, How to Measure Everything, uh, is a fantastic uh, primer around how to think through creative ways of using data that you have already. Now, if you don't have instrumentation, then I highly suggest investing in what's known as Elastic Log Search Tech. Now, I'm suggesting starting with product logs, uh, mostly because it's generally pretty easy to convince a dev team to put in diagnostic telemetry if it doesn't already exist. And then once you have Elastic Log Search, um, your dev team's gonna find it just fa absolutely fantastic on its ability to help them diagnose in-flight issues. Um, but it is also extremely useful to uh, you if you're gonna go into this, um, into the data space. There are a lot of open source goodness out there. Uh, the cloud has uh, is absolutely your friend. Both, a, both AWS as well as Microsoft have a great tech here. Microsoft just released a product that internally we have been using uh, close to three years now. And I love this thing. It is called Azure Data Explorer. And it is uh, the best thing uh, for someone like me that has come around in a very long time. Um, there is no silver bullet though. Uh, so look, think about your context and research the solutions where you can, you can get started with a very low ROI. Don't try to architect everything up front. Uh, that could uh, there is a lot of options here, and you could just spend the next several years building it and have the entire business and market change out from underneath you during that time five or six times. Um, if your team it does operate a service and you have monitored telemetry, get that. That is absolutely uh, hugely valuable. Um, there's a lot of great things you can do with it. Uh, I will talk through a couple of them in the next one. Uh, and then you have to do data movers. And what you wanna do is uh, most of the time, I, I don't know what it is globally. I do know that within Microsoft, it is, it is generally the dev team's responsibility for the diagnostic instrumentation, um, as well as any monitoring telemetry that, that may be there. Uh, and a lot of the times that isn't going to be the best way to store the data for data science purposes. But there's no reason why you can't um, 
clone that and curate your own version of the data via what's known as uh, ETL jobs, um, which is extract, extract, transform, load for those not in the, the data engineering business. Um, and the positive thing is if you don't understand data engineering, there are a lot of resources out there and the tech has gotten a lot simpler. Uh, it's one of the main reasons why I recommend starting with Elastic Log Search technology um, because they, uh, they don't require you to understand your schema. Uh, everything can just come in. Uh, and so there's a low friction to starting. Um, curation, when you're going through this, and, and again, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, there are different phases, and I do recommend that you store data differently for each of these phases, like the raw data you just collect, and then you cook it, and cooking it means you kind of remove errors. And then you create what's known as a normal normalization view on this, which, which allows you to reuse that data much better. And then you're gonna build um, knowledge views. Okay? Um, and these are the, the knowledge views are generally are what you're gonna use to power your visualizations or your AI. Uh, for those who do understand uh, data science, uh, there's this process called feature selection. And, and you're gonna put that in your knowledge phase. Um, now, inform, <clears throat> what I did, and here you can see an example, my team, we put together a portal site and we branded it. We called ours Monocle, uh, and we created a brand when we first started so that people know that there's data available that can help answer questions. Um, and you, it's a simply create, create visuals, link to it, make it easy for people to find. Um, but don't do data puke or stoplight type dashboards because again, um, once you start doing that, then you, you will open up the floodgates for other people to have other status stuff and that those aren't valuable. What you need to get to is a place where you're able to drive action. Stoplight reports are mostly statusy things. And, um, what the business needs is for the status to change generally. And those are the reports that are gonna be way more valuable for you to invest in. Um, I do strongly encourage where possible and where allowed to take your data and take you curate it and send it to the business customer, make them part of the solution. This is gonna help you to accelerate and help you to, to clarify what makes them happy. Uh, and then once you have all this, really you should be trying to answer some of the questions and, and do exploratory analysis. At this phase, the, the real goal that you're trying to achieve with the informed phase is number one, certainly there's a PR thing. Uh, you can't scale to understand all of the domain knowledge, but you really want to build trust in the data with the current decision makers. It's really, critical that they view that the data that you have curated makes sense and is useful, okay? Because you're not gonna really be able to, to take them out of the decision-making business without that trust there. Um, the next phase is recommend. Uh, so if you've gone through the action of, of the, the, the action plan or the alignment phase, you should now have the ability to take the data and be able to, to chunk it into segments where you can score and rank by the most valuable. This is important in order to scale your engineering and calendar time. Uh, take off the first biggest chunk first, obviously. Um, and hypothesis testing, uh, this is the traditional A-B testing model uh, it's extremely valuable there. Uh, there is a complicated way of doing it and there is a simple way of doing it. I, I do highly recommend researching into that and just get started. Um, and you wanna connect it to, to your action list uh, below. Uh, when you first start doing uh, the recommendation phase, the very simplest thing 
is you have identified your your users and you just automate uh, notifications to them around the recommendation. You you say, hey, we noticed this this um, this regressed, and that regression had a 30% impact to uh, this particular customer base. Um, that will help drive action and help give visibility to this, uh, to, to what you've done. And once you see that people are just doing, well, actually the point of this phase, I, I should read that part. The point of this phase is what you're trying to now do is use the data to make decisions and build trust, not only with you, but with the users that the recommendation uh, is actual, uh, that it's the right thing to do more often than not. Um, when, if you're in a, in a if, when you get to this phase, if you're still sort of in a data affirmed phase, it's gonna be relatively easy to, to disprove beliefs based off of intuition. And um, now uh, it, it is one of my favorite things to do. I, I just adore it. Uh, anytime I can get into a room where I am able to confidently tell a group of PMs that the way the business actually runs is nowhere even close to what they think it runs, uh, I just love it. Um, and then with the amount of data uh, and the processing I'm able to do, I can defend it. Uh, and I think back to the old days when I would be in a PM sitting over a bug database, uh, I would be with a PM looking over a bug database and then just arguing around theory. This is vastly more satisfying. And I will tell you, I am far more capable of driving uh, what put me in QA in the first place, and that is a strong passion around solving customer problems. Um, this scales way more better. Once once you see the decision makers are just doing what you recommended, uh, because of course all the visualizations and all the instrument or uh, uh, everything that you've produced, every time someone is using something that you've produced, you've instrumented that. So you know when they're using it and when they're not. And when you see that they're just taking the action that you're suggesting, it's time to prioritize. Trust is there. It's now time to remove them from that decision-making process. Um, now, whether or not that makes sense is gonna depend on the context that you're working through. And there are, there are considerations here. Uh, BCDR, GDPR, retuning, uh, making sure that your system doesn't go down when it's in an off offline model, right? And, and it's, it's essentially powering a user to make a decision. Um, yeah, it can go offline and, and there's not a lot of consequences at times. But when you're now in the online world, um, yeah, you need, you need to have uh, that consideration. Data usage and scale, yeah, uh, that's another thing that we you can't be surprised by. Um, all right, so that's the whole thing in a theory. Um, I just have a few slides left, so I'll try to finish in the next three minutes and see if there's any questions. Um, one of the things that I do to bootstrap, when when we started this, I recommend uh, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna sort of stay in a QA role and you're gonna try to start this, then go with uh, quality of service concerns. These are things like reliability or availability or error rate. These are bread and butter of QA already. Uh, but what I will ask you to do is instead of thinking of it as positive or failures, think of it as histograms. So here you can see I'm, I'm showing a histogram um, of, of positive or, or particular rates in the process and what's important to the architecture. Uh, you can see in the middle of the chart, for example, uh, there is a thing called data retrieval time, and you can see that there's actually two uh, distributions. Uh, the distribution is sort of like a, a bell curve-like thing. Uh, in data science, these are called two modes. And you can see that there's, there's one mode that's really short 
and between one and 1 1.5 units and another one that's between two and 2.5 units and um, and you can also see that the one between two and 2.5 units uh, contains a lot more data. Well, upon research, this particular one was actually um, uh, due to a, a bad architecture that was running slowly. It would return, but every so often it would re run slowly. Now, if you look at this on average, it, people would go, hey, it's fine. But then you can see is that no, actually it's fine on average, but the majority of our customers are having a really bad experience. And when you think of it this way, it really helps to drive forward. A lot of teams today are doing um, automation. My best suggestion to you is uh, use automation to drive load, but get rid of your automation oracles, get rid of that code. Instead, rewrite it to do validation using the data. Then you're gonna be able to, once you go live, you're gonna be able to um, repurpose your validation code as monitors, as, as indication of a customer pain. And then lastly, once you've gone through sort of the, the QoS bootstrapping, um, then you can try to, bridge to quality of experience uh, and what that means is does the metric impact revenue or growth or customer related pain issues and when you get to that phase because you have confidence around uh, the data and how to use it i will tell you it is wonderful uh, and and again it did not take me personally much to get to that point where I'm able to draw those connections. And a big part of that is my QA training, augmented with, uh, again, my stats ML training. Um, now more complicated things in the real world, ML has been used for lots of things uh, that are related to uh, Q typical QA concerns, like what, my, my current favorite one is what, what are the sequences through the product that are, that are correlating to say customer support calls? Um, that is not something that is really easy to do in the old world. Uh, today, we, uh, we have a lots of telemetry. We're able to do that correlation. We're able to even connect it to the customer directly. Uh, and so this helps to accelerate and helps to get the business doing the right thing at the right time, as well as satisfy the customer. Um, closing, uh, the high order bit here is target actionability. Um, uh, a lot of data scientists will come out and, and they will heavily pivot around accuracy. I will tell you that is not all that important. All you need to do is make sure you're more accurate than the current way decisions are being made, but you do have to target actionability. And then getting in this space, credibility is crucial. Uh, one of the stories I tell my teams is you have exactly one time to stand up tell a story to an executive using data and be wrong. Um, my, my currency is absolutely trust. And without it, uh, I'm not going to be able to move forward because there's too many humans, too many things that I have to uh, convince. Uh, and then the other one, if you get into data science type things and uh, speak human you don't need to use terms like p-value or standard deviation uh, you need to translate it to that and that helps bring them aboard and help them understand uh, and then i don't want to i want to make sure i don't run out of time but i will hit my my biggest important thing um, ethics is critical here uh, gdpr is in place throughout most of the world now uh, although it's critical obviously in in europe but even outside of that here the thing i would say is once you get in a place where you're you're looking at customer telemetry even if your legal team says otherwise please treat this as 
the property of the customer. And you want to be doing things for the business, but that are also benefit the customer uh, and make it a win-win, not one or the other. Um, there are things that we can do with ML. There are things that are possible in, in the future. And I do see a lot of people coming out of school, coming up with crazy ideas that I think I honestly believe would have a negative impact on society. Whenever I get called into schools, the first thing, this is something that I hit hard. I want every school curriculum in the data science space to be requiring an, an ethics class. Um, you do it right, this, this has a huge impact and fun. Um, my data science team, in, in our, uh, within a short period of time, we were, we were directly responsible to two order magnitudes of improvement in availability and in the compute space, that is the one metric that matters. That is the metric that brings in customers. Um, that said, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I don't know how much time I left for uh, questions, but I'll hand it back to you, Chris. Yeah, uh, we do have some time. Uh, so if you have questions, please get those in. So one question came in and it said, um, after Cambridge, like the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal um, and with GDPR, it seems like we're moving uh, much, moving towards a more data centric and, and, and privacy aware world. So do you see that as a risk to like what you do now? Do you think like in a couple of years, we won't have as much access to high um, quality data like you do now? Um, yes and no. There's certainly a lot of questions you can't, you can't answer. Um, uh, but I would also, I would say that in my, and again, my team is deeply focused on, on the customer space. And I would say there is no business critical question that I haven't been able to answer with, without the data that I'm not allowed to have. Uh, the, the, so if you wanted to do targeted emails to particular individuals, um, so yeah, I could see, for example, marketing teams or the ad space. Yeah, this is gonna hurt them. Um, for, for stuff that I am doing, uh, no, it doesn't have much of an impact. Uh, when we get into a phase of uh, one of the key concerns there uh, in that space is virality. And virality is the ability to ensure customers are actually bringing in customer more customers for you. Um, this is hypothetical. I think if I were working on that problem right now, I do think that that would be a hard one. Uh, but I'll stick with my prior answer. I don't think in terms of like what makes customers happy, I don't think that's gonna have much of an impact. Uh, the, the general rules are is you have to be able to de-aggregate their information. You cannot be able to identify that. And then you need to make sure your backend has the ability to delete their data, right? The, the, the right to be forgotten is critical. Um, but generally when one or two people delete their data, it doesn't have much of an impact to your analysis or your models. Great. Um, so Brent, can you actually put up uh, your slides again? And um, if you have anything on how, pe how people can contact you. Uh, so the next question was, uh, you were talking a little bit about um, uh, the technologies and the tools that you use. So one of the common um, stacks for, I guess, uh, telemetry is like the ELK stack. Um, sure. So, yeah. Is, can you talk a little bit about um, like the, the tooling that's involved? Uh, the elk stack is not one. Unfortunately, I can't. Like the one that that, that I know that's popular. I need a better way of doing this. Is a popular open source stack. Um, Microsoft, unfortunately, so where my direct expertise is, Microsoft does have a habit of uh, what I call not a not invented here, uh, meaning Microsoft prefers to make its own versus using something else. 
Um, it's it's something that's improving, uh, but it's telemetry stacks. Most of them are are ingrown. Uh, Elk's not one I have any direct uh, relationship to. I can highly recommend. Um, uh, there is a there is a technology uh, for a backend, literally called ELS. Uh, it's not only a, a a type of tech. It's basically a NoSQL type model. Um, I can highly recommend that as a, as a way to go. Uh, uh, and also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Microsoft's offering Azure Data Explorer uh, is the best, is one of the best things I've ever had in my entire career. Cool. Um, yeah, I can say from personal experience, like the at my company, uh, we actually use the Elast the Elk stack, which is um, Elasticsearch, Logs.io, and Kibana. I think in your example, Elasticsearch and Kibana were the two similar oh. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, I, re I it just occurred to me that Elks and ELS are are actually the same thing. Yeah, it um, sounds pretty similar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I actually think they're the same thing. I think my deck has it uh, attributed wrong. I'll fix okay. that. Nice. Um, and so uh, another question, um, again, people feel free to, uh, to submit your questions. Even if we go longer, this, like I said, this is recorded. So you can, if you don't have time to hear the answer, uh, you can get to it in the recording. Um, so, and I know you, this is a question that came in and I, I know you've mentioned this at the podcast before, but so, um, one of the more common, uh, missions or, uh, goals of, of test groups um, is they think that uh, they're providing information. And in your slides, you sort of mentioned that that's like the traditional way, but it, it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Can you explain on that a little bit? Uh, let me let me add clarity to that. Uh, let's see if I can do it faster this way. Yes, I can. Um, so, what I am saying is, how do I, all right, here's how I'll put it. There, I'll put it as a positive, I'll, I'll, I'll put two spins on it, a positive and a negative spin on it, okay? Um, the way information provision is moving in the world, it is, it is a matter of time before uh, that information being provided can be automated, okay? That is the negative, the negative aspect. Um, data is a much stronger way than intuition in today's world to inform the business of, of the key insights that they need to act on or the key factors that they need to consider. Um, and one issue we see over and over again is essentially the process of inform informing pre-production is often not aligned with the reality of post-production. Now, this is, this is heavy aligned with the, the service space, okay? Now, uh that's the negative way of saying it the negative way of saying it is in essence uh if you view that that's your your role um i don't know when but i i will confidently state um that's going to be an insufficient reason for for uh people to be kept in those roles I do think data in this space is going to be a threat to that aspect of a, of a QA job. However, the old phrase, if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, what I'm suggesting is, but right now as it stands, you're the domain experts in this inform. Take that knowledge and be the people who uh, take it the next step take it the next step to recommendation, taking the next step to automation of decision making. Okay, so um, so it's a positive and negative. I, I do think that the that the QA for these particular topics are the ones actually best trained on this. Uh, and I also think that a lot of the aspects is that they 
they stop themselves because they view themselves, their job as informing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm trying to challenge that approach and, and challenge people to go, no, we're the domain experts here. We actually can actually take this forward, do a better job and own the decision in the end. Does that answer it? Yeah, definitely. And then, uh, so we have one last question before before we're gonna go. And um, you sort of already mentioned this, but um, you started talking about like, so the question is, how do you get started with this? You sort of already mentioned, or you did mention um, starting with produ uh, production logs, but could you just recap that? Yeah, so start with production logs. Start with the data that, you're, that your dev already has. And it's going to be, Generally, it's going to be a diagnostic feed of some form. You know, devs often will put in like error logs and asserts or um, what is the slide I'm trying to get to? Oh, uh, it's that one. I'm going the wrong way. Uh, dude, dude. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chris. I don't. All right, forget this. So the slide that I was talking to you about um, informing people, oh, that this is it. So if you start with the logs that Dev already has, and generally it's going to be things where they they can monitor what happened, what errors occurred, okay? Well, what you can do is you can take that and say, all right, draw a histogram. Is there a way for us to determine uh, when components fail? Is it is there a way to um, improve? Uh, here's a common one that, that I did actually when I started in this one, is I looked at time spent failing, this availability stat. So what I noticed is that when a small component way in the back end failed, uh, the customer experience got, even though we had retries and even though we had all the, the, the typical things that we would do, what we saw is that the 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 end to end recovered, but everything got extremely laggy for the customer. Um, failure rates. Uh, here's a here's another simple one, and it it connects it to QO, QOE. So let's say there's a particular area of your product. Um, that's raising a search and that's being captured uh, captured by um, an, a, a hidden exception handler. Uh, it captured and swallowed and then logged. Well, what you can do is look at that and see if there's a correlation to uh, customers returning to the product, as an example. Uh, this, uh, The more that you can connect the data points that you see within dev to a customer impact statement, either positive or negative. Hey, you know, every time we this event occurs for a customer, they don't return for another three months. Uh, anytime you can do something like that, that is uh, extremely valuable and um, very easy to, to motivate dev. I cannot tell you, it, that is my standard practice now. Anytime I see dev um, sending on the intuition ground I go look at their data and I find a way to connect it to something that's important to the business. And I will either uh, then circle back with them and say, hey, you know what? I did a deep dive here. Your intuition is accurate or, you know what? Your intuition is wrong. Here's why. And when, I, when I'm able to show them directly the customer impact, um, my triage conversations go, have cut orders of magnitude down. Um, I, I cannot tell you how it has gone from uh, just continuous arguments to nope, no more argument and the bug is fixed the next day. Massive Fantastic. accelerator. Fantastic. Um, all right. So that's that's all the questions that we had. Um, so uh, Brent, did you have anything else that you um, wanted to say or, or share? Oh, no. Thank you for your time. Uh, all right. Thanks everyone for your time.